Hello everybody, this is Havoc and welcome to the first video in my coverage of the Total War 3 Kingdoms event. I was invited by Creative Assembly to spend a few days in San Francisco where I and a handful of other creators were able to get in a couple of hours of actual campaign gameplay playing as Liu Bei. Now, I only get 20 minutes to cover everything I saw, which isn't a lot of time considering how much information I recorded. I'll be splitting these videos up into a few smaller ones, letting you choose what you want to watch. As the title says, this video will focus on what I saw on the campaign map, focusing on just a few of the bigger details in the game that I noticed. Enough jabbering, let's dive into it. Beginning with what I loved the most, the UI, the campaign map, and the tech tree. Total War has constantly been on point in the past few titles with the first two, and Three Kingdoms is no exception. I know I've talked about this several times before, but it's an entirely new experience when you're the one playing it. The campaign map is absolutely gorgeous, and they really took the landscape and gave it a depth even to a different degree than Warhammer, which has my favorite campaign map currently. The valleys really seem a lot lower than the highlands and mountains. Rivers are more pronounced, they're wider, they're bigger, and cities butt up right next to them. But what really impressed me was that Total War is finally getting a day-night cycle. By default, the day-night cycle runs on 10 minutes each, meaning a full cycle is around 20 minutes of campaign map time. However, there are settings where you can choose different times of day that you want the campaign to permanently be set at, including real time. Real time takes the time of day you are in real life, syncs it up with the game, and sets that as your time in the game. Depressing for those who constantly play only at night, such as myself, but a great feature if you're able to play at different times of the day. UI really brings everything together though. Of course, I was lost at first, but once you get the ropes down, it's a very coherent system for about 90% of the game. For any time it wasn't, Total War has a new feature known as the Tool Overlay. At any time it's toggled, it will take whatever is on the screen and give you a block-by-block -block breakdown of the UI, showing what it does and how it's useful for you. It's a fantastic feature, and I believe both new Total War players and veterans alike will be using it for the game. Not everything was perfect about either of these though. Frequently in my short playthrough, the amazing rock formations that were fantastic to look at frequently blocked my view, especially in post-battle animations where the battle took place close to these rock formations. I spent several post-battle seconds staring at a giant rock that filled up my screen because of this. It's not something I was very excited about. There were a few issues with the UI as well, namely some confusion on appointing characters to positions of power, and lack of a resource filter on the overview map though that was a personal critique for myself as I use that filter a lot in historical Total War games. Three Kingdoms has so many new UI features, it's bound to give most Total War players a bit of a stump at the start, so I didn't feel bad about taking my time with it. The one thing that was perfect to me was the tech tree, which is a literal tree. This is the best tech tree we've seen to date, and really goes to show the continuity of UI design within the entire game. Techs now unlock every spring regardless and follow more along the lines of edicts than actual tech. I focused on the top left branch as it quickly unlocked more trade routes and means to boost my economy. Much like in Total War Attila, there are several technologies where branches cross requiring two or more previous branches of tech to be issued before you can access it, which adds a little bit of life to the tech tree itself. With the emphasis on characters in this game, from the tech that I saw, several were influencing the satisfaction ratings between different character types, and that's something to very strongly think about in your game. If you have a majority of, say, champion characters, issuing tech that keeps them satisfied is going to be a good practice. I spent a good chunk of my time just looking at information across the board, and as such, I didn't get to spend a lot of time diving into settlements in the economy as I would have liked. That being said, there is a lot to it just from what I saw. Provinces are now called commanderies, and they are split up almost exactly like Thrones of Britannia. Your minor settlements contain resource-only buildings, with your main settlement containing the rest of your government and economical chains. Unlike Thrones, minor settlements do have garrisons, which can be upgraded as the resource building levels up. Faction support is a new factor to consider. It seems to be the Three Kingdoms equivalent of culture or religion from previous games, though faction support carries a lot more weight for your economy and your armies. When you take over a settlement, its population may or may not support your own faction. Assuming they don't initially, you'll see some significant downsides, such as reduced military supplies, reduction in income from all resources, and a pretty big reduction to replenishment. No doubt there are buildings that will help bring that support up, but your character alone should be able to sway the population in your favor after a few turns. Speaking of population, it is directly tied to income and replenishment. You can see in the commandery of Dong, my maximum population is 1.3 million, but it is currently only at 222,000. With my population so low compared to its max, 
I see a 25% tax income reduction from the peasantry. Considering that tax modification is locked behind your faction's leader rankings, there's really no way but population growth factors to help that number. One thing I didn't think to try was to recruit units and then check that population. Since replenishment is tied to the population, it makes sense that recruitment would as well, though that isn't guaranteed. Also, I was fairly disappointed that there is only one class type represented. You have a peasant population, I don't see why you can't implement a middle and upper class population with income tiers tied to it that makes sense. Though I suppose modders could come in and save the day on that front. Also having a drastic effect on population is post capture options on taking a settlement. We've always had the three options of occupy, loot and occupy, and sacking, but now we get a great breakdown of these effects. From an economical standpoint, you could easily sack several settlements and cripple an enemy's economy as 80% of the population would die with each settlement you sack. Resources play a higher role for both the economy and in settlements as they are needed significantly sooner to upgrade many buildings. That being said, multiple trade routes are not available right off the bat. They require technology and leader rank to increase. This puts a higher significance and some future forward thinking on who you would want to trade with for a resource or who you would rather just conquer to achieve it. For instance, T was a resource needed in order to rank up several buildings to level 2, and where I was on the campaign map, T was nowhere close for conquest and I would have had to use a trade agreement or exchange just to be able to further my basic economical needs. One of the last big factors that contributes to your economy is character salary. Every character in your faction will have a salary tied to them. If given any position, from a governor to your heir, that salary goes up. With several positions to fill in your court, that can rack up pretty quick. An administrator's salary alone can run you around three or 400 gold a turn. As your empire grows and you take on more characters, their salary is something you'll need to keep a close eye on. That's all for this video of the campaign map features in Total War 3 Kingdoms from my event coverage. If you enjoyed the content, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel as more content will be delivered for 3 Kingdoms, but also Total War and for other strategy games as well. Thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you in the next video.